It was calming to take in once again the familiar sights, sounds and smells of London. The crew was larger now than ever, and while I feared we might lose a few, after an evening of drink and debauchery, every one of them waited on the dockside, eager to return to the sea. And while I was as eager as they, there was business still to attend to. There was first the very many port reports gathered in the recent weeks. The Cumanian Canal, the Iron Republic, the Mangrove College, the Grand Geode, the Salt Lines, Quakers Haven. Simultaneously, Sphinxstone was delivered to the Ministry of Public Decency. Then came the strategic information, of which the Admiralty required more from Mount Palmerston. I had not a single artifact to pass on to the alarming scholar, yet I still thought it polite to stop by, and I should be glad that I did, as they presented a small present. You've been so very helpful, and I want to give you something for your next voyage. I bottled it myself. It smelled pickled, chemical, salty. Once it may have been eel flesh. The scholar assured me that it had vital and nutritional virtues, and to save it for an emergency, perhaps. Finally, I retired to my elegant townhouse to write out what you read now and to shake myself from the nightmares that followed me. It was the 25th of February, 1888, once I stepped foot back on the sea shower. We were leaving with our hull full of fuel, provisions, and our hearts at ease. This voyage would take us further east than any of us dreamed. Toward Mount Palmerston we would sail, but my eyes lay far beyond it. I needed a true Z story if I was to earn the trust of my father's benefactor. We stopped by Hunter's Keep, looking in on the ruins. Nought had changed. Wind, weeds, and water. Far to the northeast, Demo Island would mark our next stop. Yet our journey was not without trouble. The black smoke of a pirate pinnacle emerged from the ink. But the old vessel was no match for the cannons of the sea shower. With but two volleys, the pinnacle slipped below the waves. Amongst what little floating cargo remained, spider silk was found. The dark silhouette of Demo Island emerged. And on its shores, we found a Blemigan colony. While we had combated the creatures before, I sought now to observe them. It would be dangerous, however. Quietly, I approached. They did resemble the fruiting bodies of fungus. The mound itself looked fungal. Are they the same organism? And do they communicate, cooperate? I watched as they dragged a marsh rat up the side of the mound, bickering over the disposition of its flesh. I watched as a half dozen stood on top of the mound, listening respectfully to the chittering of a seventh. It was improbably reminiscent of a poetry recital. I took as many notes as I might. Returning to the ship, we would sail onwards, our next stop being Mount Palmerston itself. But yet again, our travels would be interrupted. Another pirate ship, to be sure. Yet this was no clunker, an Alcaeus class vessel. It was a dangerous dance, yet our nerves held firm. Gripping the helm, I watched as yet another sunk below the waves. And to my surprise, a familiar face clung to the last scraps of floating debris. Fate had brought I and the pirate poet together once again. A lifeboat was dispatched. With business dealt with, the pirate poet joined myself and a few select members of the senior crew for a late supper. She treated the assembled audience to baptism of glass. About her first days at Z, after years of servitude. By demand, she follows it with shorter works and reforged. A cry for broken chains. 
in polythreme, we are given words. We are not allowed to hope that they will be kind. In London, I learned to write my own, and in that moment I was free. One day, others of my homeland will read them, and they too will learn. One day, my king's dreams must end. Dinner followed. Hot wine and cold spiced meats. Zayla's openly placed bets on whether she actually would eat. The pirate poet ignored them. Her stoic facade didn't even quiver until dessert was served. At that, just for a moment, even she could not hide a slight smile. Sorbet, Captain? She asked, eye ridges raised. Don't make me tell folk you're even softer than they say. And with that came the promise that we would deliver the poet to Mount Palmerston. There we would go our separate ways. All seemed well, until the crew called attention to a disturbance in the fog. A faustic corsair, a mighty vessel. I would take no chance this day, and commanded we open fire at once. The cannons roared, and the engine bellowed. We fought with hard angles and a close approach, the two vessels kissing in the fog. Yet we remained in the perfect position to allow our cannons to fire and to stay well away from theirs. A cry from the crew goes up as the Corsair ship stutters, falters, and then fails. Its crew dove overboard, disappearing into the fog. The sinking ship was ours as was its hold. Inside, a cache of curiosities and a rich, wild scent. Whatever was in these barrels, it smelt heavenly. Soup. Glorious soup. The only fine thing to ever come from Mount Palmerston. Do devils make it? Or dream it? It was quite the find all the same. And so it was that we exited the fog. Mount Palmerston, blazing ahead of us. Leaving the port behind, my contact here remained in the ruined granary. A cowled and buzzing shape clasped my elbow, whispering in my ear, its breath lava and old brass. I have what I came for. The whole exchange left me feeling rather unwell, and I know not why, but I found myself walking up that crater once again. The heat had me craving a cup of tea. And there she was, the deviless, leaning against her cottage wall, twirling the parasol and fanning herself. Suddenly, I recalled a promise a present was required. Do you happen to have a case of souls for me? No, I'm not going to eat them. We don't eat souls, usually. I'm not clear how that story got around. I just, I told you that I miss London. I miss hell. I'd like a keepsake. And all souls are ours, you know, by right. I shifted uncomfortably under her gaze. I had no souls in my position. Or you could just lend me yours. She bit her lip and looked up into my eyes. I'll keep it safe. Much safer than at Z. If you drown, it will be here with me. For always. Mortals do drown so. She placed a slender, sallow hand on my wrist. Through my cuff it was warm as a stone in the sun. It won't hurt at all. I looked behind me to realize that I was here alone. The crew still down below in Port Palmerston. Perhaps she was right. Perhaps it would be safer with her. It was a surprisingly painless process. Perhaps this was how a bottle felt when it was uncorked. A moment of nervousness, a moment of release, and then a certain freedom. The deviless smiled radiantly, holding up my soul in its jar, cuddling it like a kitten. Let me tell you something very special. She whispered it in my ear. Her breath smelt like hot stone. 
But you should go now. Thank you. Come back soon. I dare not write the secret here in this journal. The fact that my very own soul now resided with her, that is secret enough. Before leaving, we packed the sea shower with all the fuel that we could muster. And to the east, we set sail, narrowly escaping a nearby corsair, disappearing into the fog bank and leaving them behind. We had entered the storm bones. St. Elgius sent his fire to dance in the air on deck. By the 1st of March, we had reached Frostfound once again. With Stoddard's Haven not far to the south, I performed my report and spoke with the squatters out front for a time, asking them about the castle. What they spoke of was nothing new, yet I jotted down their tales of terror all the same. There was nothing else for us here. Turning to our map, the far east was blank to us, an unknown, with ten units of fuel still in our hold. I sought to erase the unknown, and so into the dark we would go. As Frost found, drifted away, a strange sight neared us. In amongst the ice, a staircase wound and red. Something red. It was the 2nd of March now. There were strange puffs of warmth from the air behind the ice. This was the fabled pillared sea, where Irene will lie. Lies has always lain. We could see it now. Irene. None have ever spoken truthfully of this place. Irene, the pillared city. We approached the dock, Carlisle's haven, with a mixture of optimism and fear in our hearts. Irene, the great pillared city. She will rise from the sea and the ice like dawn. She will be garlanded with red and decked with gold. The seven serpent will watch you longingly from its high pedestal. Here, you always arrive as a stranger, but when you leave, some part of you will always remain. Or so it is said. A report, as ever, came first. Yet, when I sat down to write the report, it was already written. Who wrote it? The report recorded that it was already written when it was found. Who found it? The report described another report, which will indicate the name of the finder. But where is the other report? There was a footnote which described when I would record its location. When that will be, when all is well, and all manner of things is well. Then there was the House of the Amber Sky. Rest well, traveler. Our waters are warm. Our cushions are petal soft. Lay your head here. You will be healed, or better yet, you will be renewed. Payment and coffee, yes, please. I closed my eyes. The house of the amber sky was a roofless space beneath the false stars of the neath, rich with the scent of Irene roses. Despite the ice, it's warm as a desert evening. I arranged myself on the cushions and closed my eyes for what felt like just a moment. Beneath the skin of dreams, behind the faces of mirrors, an orange sun sails in a fervid sky. Here are the borderlands of that place, close by Irene, and closer still to the house of the amber sky. And here I was in another place, the sun warm on my uncovered head. The jungle around me was rich with violent color, buzzing with insects and unseen life. I explored just a little. There was a shattered tower at the top of a low hill. A tower stump stood. The masonry looked irene The door was rotted, the space within filled with thorned vines. The cracked mirrors still hung on the walls, and in each one I saw a different scene. Bright-eyed soldiers bind sharks in iron. Clay men war with clothed colonies in the streets of Polythreme. The alarmed scholar 
cracks, soul tubes beneath their teeth. Truth, dream or both. I awoke in the house of the amber sky, my clothes stained with the juices of crushed leaves. I left there, wandering to the last market, aptly named. First, to the fisher of the dawn. Here, I sold a sack of dark drop coffee beans for a bale of parabola linen, taking our total to five. Then, I sought to trade a secret for a lamentable relic from a shop named Threshold. I looked to purchase a strange catch. It looked fishy, but something told me the crew would approve. It also seemed wise to buy a few more units of fuel, even if it was far more expensive. Then there was Wind Come Calling, a trader selling tales, tales and more tales. And it was here, here that I could finally find what I seek, a sea story. Strange truths are told of the waves and what lies beneath. The lies are even stranger. But this story, this Z story, this is what I needed. What I sought for so long. The last piece of the puzzle. The last piece I needed in London. The trader sought two tales of terror. I was happy to provide. Returning to the ship, I sought out my surgeon. I still sought to know more about her and her father. She usually became more talkative when she had something to cut. That strange catch should suffice. There was flensing, deboning, and orderly arrangement of scales from large to small. This was the creature's favorite organ, she said, working briskly with tweezers and blade. Don't touch it. The purple bits are toxic. She only turned to personal matters once she'd had a chance to rinse her fingers. I get my proficiency with metal from both sides of the family, she said, watching my expression closely. Then, my mother was a favorite with Mr. Iron. She says that they only work together, that Mr. Iron sponsored her work and provided her with tools, sharper tools that do not bend so easily. It was not a full answer, but it was a start. I left her to continue her work. Returning to the deck, I approached the bow, my eyes drawn far to the west, to London. It was there Huffman had the answers I sought. I would bring my father's bones home. I owed him that much. I owed him everything. What? is a writer with no tales to tell. One's imagination only takes them so far, and one can only imagine what is known. The Z has stories to tell. Its waves speak words. Its stone contains secrets. Everything I have typed thus far is the God's truth. And even out here, even in the far eastern reaches of the Z, I knew there was still oh so much to be seen.